between mercy and grace. Does anybody know the difference? <laughs> anybody? No? What's that? One is not deserved. Uh huh. And one is freely given. Yeah. Okay, that's good. That's good. I can tell you didn't study, but okay, no. <laughs> so here, here's what it goes. So I'm going to pre preach on mercy and grace. There's so many sermons about mercy and grace, but God led me to preach about being merciful and gracious to one another and to others. Because so many times, I came from a big church as well, and we're the body of Christ, and a lot of us ain't doing that. And we're called to do that, because Christ did that for us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Here's the definition. Okay. When you think of God's mercy, you automatically think about grace. Many people get the two mixed up, although they are close in meaning. They're not the same thing. Grace is God's unmerited, not deserved favor. And it will be a mercy. Mercy is God not giving us the punishment that we deserve for our sin. And that is so true. For the way that I live my life, I don't even deserve to be up here. Because of God's grace and His mercy and His favor upon my life, I'm here today because of it. I'm going to open up with uh, Psalms 103, verses 8 and 10. Amen? Amen. Psalms 103, verses 8 and 10. Okay. It says, Lord, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger. And abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us. Nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins. Nor punished us according to our iniquities. Romans 5.8 says. Yet while I was still a sinner. He sent his son to die for me. On the cross. That right there. Is mercy. He had mercy on me. When he knew that I was an adulterer, a drunk, a whoremonger, he still sent his son to die for me. Amen. When he knew that I was involved even in witchcraft, all that stuff, <clears throat> he still sent his son to die for me. Yes, and what I find, find hard sometimes is when somebody offends us, we have to react. We could react with words that we shouldn't be speaking. We could react, you know, some people get, when you're, they have that rope rage, they're giving you the bird everywhere you're going or whatever. That's what I got to talk to Lisa about, but anyways, so, no. <laughs> But why is it that we can't show mercy to other people? We're going to read this where God has shown us mercy and where He tells us, He declares it, that we ought to do the same to others. Amen. And the hardest ones is your loved ones, husbands and wives, to show mercy to one another. Preach it. But that's for more later. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. There's a reason God talks about mercy so much in the Bible. Because it is one of the most important character traits He wants to develop in us. And why? Because He has mercy on us on a daily basis. No characteristic describes God more fully than mercy. It is the first trait that God used to describe Himself in Scripture. It is also an important characteristic for any serious follower of Jesus Christ to develop. If it is such a core part of who God is, 
It has got to be essential for us. That's one thing that we have to put in practice. Paul says to be imitators of Paul. Why? Who was Paul? Paul did, you name it, he was persecuting God's church, he was stealing them, he was dragging them out of their homes. But when God showed up on Damascus and told him, Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting? So no, he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting the church? Those who persecute me, are those who persecute you are persecuting me. Everything that Paul did, but when God showed up at the right time, at the right place, he had mercy on Paul. Well, didn't God do that for us? He showed up at the right time, at the right place. And he did the same for us in showing mercy. Before you judge others for their sins and failures, remember how many times God has forgiven you. When it seems inconvenient to help somebody in need, stop and remember how God has comforted you when you were hurting. How many of us take the time when we some, when we see somebody hurting? Literally. Because I know we see it every day in the streets. Sometimes we know that we're at the light and we're seeing this person and the first thing that probably pops in our minds, they're just doing drugs, they're a bunch of drug addicts. Because I know that's the person that's popped in my mind. You know, yesterday, was it yesterday? Yes. Yes, yesterday. Was it yesterday? Today's Sunday, right? Yeah. Yes, I got one, brother. Thank you. Yesterday, as we were coming around, because we got together, some of us, and we came to clean the church. So we're going down the, we're going down the road, and we hit the light, and there was this lady, you know. She was holding a sign, and, and of course, she looked dirty, and, and all this stuff. And then she tells me, sir, do you, do you at least have a quarter? See, I don't give them money, but I will buy them to eat. And I said, well, what would you like? Are you hungry? She goes, yes. I said, what would you like to eat, man? She goes, a hot dog, whatever. She says, a burger, hot dog. I said, okay, I will be right back, I told her. So we went and we had to go all the way down uh, uh, Rio Grande and hit the McDonald's and then come all the way back down to Atrisco. And she was surprised. Like, literally, she was surprised. She goes, you're back? I said, yes, I said I would come back. But how many times do we fail or we tell somebody we'll be there and we don't end up showing up? But yeah, when we're invited to do something or go somewhere to a party, we're there on time. Yeah. But when somebody is hurting out there, we can't take the time to stop and pray for them and show them the love of Christ. Show them the same mercy that God showed us when He showed up at the time, at the right time, the right place when we needed Him. That's what we're called to do, guys. We are to imitate Christ. Amen. We are to be imitators of Christ. And you know what? I'm guilty of not being an imitator of Christ. Amen. But you know what, though? We are to develop. We are to work. We are to read. Show ourselves approved. Know our word. So, so like that, when somebody asks us a question about Christ or something, we have a, we have a word to tell them the truth through God's word. Amen. And then not only that, this is the basic instructions before leaving earth. This is something that God wants to involve His Word in our hearts. So when things come up, when we're seeing people hurting, when we, when, when, when all this chaos is going around us, even when we're not getting along with our husbands or our wives, we reflect back in the Word of God. And we show mercy and grace. You know, God says that if we have favor with God, we have favor with man. And we have favor with God. So why, should, so why should we show favor to people when they're in need? If they need something. Why can't we open our doors to them in our homes? <coughs> you know, I worked at a homeless shelter on and off for the past couple of years. And you should see how many hurting, and I'm not talking hurting people that are. Family have given up on them. Like literally giving up on them. And it's like, this is a shelter. They allow people to go in and teach the word to them. But nobody would call. And it's like, how come I don't see other brothers and sisters here coming and giving them the good news? Letting them know how merciful and gracious our God is. How, 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 how he saved us from the pits of hell. 
but nobody. There's a lot of things that we can do to show people grace and mercy, guys. And you got to ask yourself that question because I don't know your relationship with, with, with God or how you, you know, only you guys know. Amen? Amen. Amen. So well. When you think about those people who, tr who try your patience, stop and remember how patient God has been with you. Well, how many of us have said, hey, they're testing my patience. I'm just up to here with them already. <laughs> my wife points to me. <laughs> but it's the truth. Isn't God patient? Yes, he is. Even if you go to scripture, and I think it's in, in Peter, where he talks about him being patient, long suffering with one another. And when you feel like getting even with somebody who has been unkind or unfair to you, Stop and remember how kind God is and was to you when you were his enemy. See, because when we were separated from Christ, we were God's enemy. He even said, if you're not for me, you're against me. And guess what? At one point in our lives, all of us were against God. We were against God. Romans 5.10 says, for if for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. See, a lot of the times we forget where God pulled us out from. We forget. We start joining, you know, because God gives us an awesome life. Yes, we go through trials and we're going to go through tribulations. But you know what? If you really see yourself, and sometimes we think we have it so bad, go out there and take a look in the streets. Go hit the shelters. Go hit these parks where they're sleeping. On the, there's a lot of people sleeping on the pavement because somebody gave up on them. You know, as much as I drank, I even went to prison for it. I said today that I was blessed and I couldn't even see it because God, I was God's enemy at one time. But I was so blessed that I didn't end up in the streets and I could have really easily landed up in the streets because I was so into alcohol. Like literally so into alcohol. And I didn't end up in the streets. That's what we need to see when we see somebody out there hurting or something. You know what? That could have been me right there. <clears throat> But God showed me his love and his patience and his long suffering to me that I'm still here today. How many of us get up and give God thanks? The first thing we open our eyes, we thank God for another day of life. Amen. Even if we're struggling with bills or even if we're struggling with family or even if we're struggling with this. But you know what? We need to be thankful. Yes. Yes. Paul says to be thankful him on everything. To be content, he says, with everything that's Amen? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Showing grace with words. And we're gonna go to we're gonna go to Ephesians chapter four, verses twenty-nine through thirty-two. When speaking with people, you should use your words that are kind and gentle. Obviously, there are times when we need to correct other people, but it never has to be done in a hateful or mean spirit way. Find a way to gently say what needs to be said. And if you read, and, 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 and if we read in Ephesians chapter four, verse twenty-nine through thirty-two, here's what the word says: Let no corrupt words. Proceed out of your mouth. But what is good, but what is good, necessary edification, that it may be in part of grace to the hearers. 
And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. But let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, he says. Let no corrupt words. How many of us still have to still deal with anger and still these words that are coming out of our mouths shouldn't be coming out of our mouths? Am I guilty? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay, Susan and Renee are pointing fingers to each other. <laughs> but why did God tell us that? He left us this instruction because He knew that that will probably take place in our life at one time or another, even when we're, we call ourselves still Christians. Although we shouldn't be doing it. He says to put away all that. Paul even goes further, I think it's in 1 Corinthians 13, where he says, For once I reasoned and I acted like a child, but I put those childish things away and I grew up. And what he meant by growing up, that he became a man of God. And he put all that stuff away from himself. Because that's not how we are to speak to people. Man, before I came to God, oh my, oh my God. I was terrible. I was evil with my words. Curse my own family. Curse myself. You know, you can even curse yourself. <laughs> oh, I can't do this. I'm stupid. I'm never going to move forward. I can't even get to this. We got to be careful. There's life or death on the words that we speak. You can bring life to somebody or you can curse somebody. <laughs> and we are to bring life to people just as Christ brought life to us, right? Yes. Well, we were dead in our trespasses. He brought life and life in abundance. He says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. For whoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But what did he say? That he gave. How many of us are giving? How many of us literally are givers? I sometimes struggle with it. I'm being real. My wife, if she could leave us broke to give, she would. Literally. She has a heart of giving. Our job is to give. If God gave us his precious son. When we were yet still sinners. Why is it hard for us to give? To give to somebody. That's why it's important to get to know your neighbor sometimes. Or your brothers and sisters in Christ. Because we don't know when somebody might need something. If God gave us. We need to give back. Amen. We have jobs because of God. We have homes, we have vehicles, we have everything because of God. Amen. Even in our tithings, how many of us are tithing our 10%? Amen. Amen. We need to do that because God tells us to do it. That's a characteristic, that's a characteristic of God. That's being an imitator of Christ. <laughs> God didn't give us so that we can hoard things and keep them for ourselves. He did it. Oh, but why should I give them? Why should I give them? Who gives me? Who helps me? That's some of our attitudes sometimes. And it's true. Guilty right here. We're called to give. God gave us. Why can't we give to others? Amen? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Look for the need of others. Can you help someone in some small way holding a door for someone who arms are full and can be a small action that helps in a great way? If you will seek out little actions you can do for others, it will help you become more grateful person. And it's true. People's lives with large financial donations or, or heroic actions are seldom within our grasp. But we can affect people. We can affect people every day with a simple kindness. Yep. With a simple kindness. Let's go to let's go to Philippians two, three, and four. Is it hard or just do? Philippians chapter two, verses three and four. Let nothing be done through selfishness, ambition, or conceit. 
but in loneliness of mind, they each esteem others better than yourself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. How many of us are still me, 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 me? See, the, the Word of God says, you know what, brothers and sisters, every time that we come and we hear a message, do you guys know that we're held accountable for it? Whatever the message may be that the Holy Spirit is giving us, we're accountable. He says it's better that we would have never known the truth than to know the truth and not do it. And when we know what we ought to do, it says in Galatians chapter 6, and we don't do it, it is sin. Yep. And guilty again. We are to esteem others better than yourself. How many of us husbands put our wives before ourselves? Yeah. Literally. Only Luis? <laughs> Come on, man. How many of us put our wives' needs before ourselves? I know just last week I told my wife, because there were seven. My dream car has always been a 71 money car. That's my dream car. So my cousin Eric sends me a picture. They were selling one. Of course, it was going to need to be worked on that for $2,500. And I told my wife, there goes my dream. I told her. <laughs> But it's selfishness. When we don't put our wife's needs, we're being selfish. Straight up. And vice versa with a woman. Are you guys putting your husband's needs before yours? Amen? Why is it so quiet in here today, guys? Amen. <laughs> It says response with grace. And we're going to go to Proverbs 51, okay? Let's get there. Proverbs 51. If I could find it. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Amen. Have you been criticized by someone? You. <laughs> yeah. Even unjustly? You don't have to let others walk over you, but you can respond in a gracious way. Yeah. Honey, stop talking to me like that. <laughs> except, <laughs> except what they have to say and thank them for their input. <clears throat> The news they bring you might upset, might upset you and hurt you deeply. The way you respond can help the healing begin immediately. A quick response with anger will leave you seething, but the sooner you can respond with a smile and a calm spirit, the sooner you will be able to see truth in their words and make the change that needs to be made. Proverbs 51, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the, of the wise use knowledge rightly, but the mouth of a fool pours forth foolishness. How many of us, I'm going to say a lot of the times, we could avoid a fight at home with our wives or with a family member, or even with somebody at the store. Literally, can we avoid it? But then they, they say something rude, and right away, boom, you got to come back at them. It says, don't pay evil for evil, he says, but pay good with evil. You know, I know a lot of the times when we go to the grocery store, they're having a hard time, man. You know, especially at Walmart, big stores, where you got these cashiers that they're just constantly dealing with hundreds or thousands of people in a day. And a lot of them probably, some of them probably are having a hard time maybe at home or something. But here we are making faces. Oh, man, here we go. Okay, why didn't they hire her? They should put somebody else better on them. You know, I'm serious. And then we go up there. To the, she might say or he might say something rude. And then we come out with another rude answer back mm -hmm. or question. 
when that's not what the Lord tells us. A soft answer turns away wrath. A soft answer. How's your day? How are you doing? And a lot of them, when you're doing your groceries, and I will tell you, it's, it's been tough, or, or I'm having a hard day, or, and then that's the time to say, you know what, God bless you, I'll pray for you. What's your name? Mm -hmm. Or even when you're standing there, throw a little prayer for them. Mm -hmm. Because we're all going through something. And we're all going to go through something on a daily basis. But a lot of the times they cut us off and we want to go back at them and I mean all kinds of craziness. <laughs> and we're Christians. My wife always has to be at me, babe, calm down. You know, just, oh. But you know what? We need to learn to be patient. Because God has been patient with us. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Let's go here. Let's go to uh, Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. It says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, and meekness, and long suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, Another, even as Christ forgave you, you must do. And I think that's one of the hardest things in our walk. Thank you. In our walk is to forgive others. A lot of the times we even have a hard time forgiving ourselves. But it says we must forgive. If God forgave us on that cross, every detail of our lives before we came to God, every sin, every inequity, why is it hard to forgive one another? A family member wrongs us. Our neighbor tells us something. Well, I do nothing wrong. Why do I have to forgive? The Bible says that if you're at the altar and you remember that a brother or sister has something against you, it says to go and leave the, leave the gift and go and make things right. Meaning that even if you didn't cause any grief or any harm, but if you know that somebody has something against you, it takes to go and make things right before you come to the altar. What does that tell you? Because if you don't go and make things right with a family member or, or even a brother or sister, even your parents sometimes, whoever it is, you come to the altar to pray, right? Well, your prayers will be hindered. That's what that is saying. Go and make things right and leave your, your, your gift and then come back. See, but a lot of us get so offensive. Well, why should I forgive them? I didn't say nothing wrong to them. I didn't do nothing wrong to them. They still owe me money. I still help them. And then they still want to treat me this way. But yet, look what God does for us. On a daily basis, we're being fed. We're being clothed. We could even come to, to a beautiful church, to a beautiful building, sit down in comfortable seats with air conditioning. And there's other places in the country that they're getting beheaded. They're getting burned in oil. Their kids, they're killing their kids right in front of them. But yet we can't forgive. You know, growing up I had a hard time. Even to the day my dad died. Because I never had a relationship with my, my biological father. You know, my stepsister, they, 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 they told me, hey, why don't you come and, you know, dad, you know, he's sick, he's going to pass away. And my first thing in my mind, well, because I went to counsel them with pastor for stuff like that. I said, well, why do I need to go? I forgave him. I don't know the man. He really don't know me. But right away, the conviction set in my heart. Well, oh, where's the love? See, how many of us want our family members to be saved? How many of us want our enemies to be saved? Amen. A co-worker that gives you a hard time. Somebody that's always gossiping about you. <clears throat> Somebody that's always pointing fingers about you. See, that's our job. Is to forgive. To show mercy and grace to others. But a lot of the time we want to hold grudges. 
and not realizing, you know what? God forgave me. If I was the only person, he would have still sent, our Father in Heaven would have still sent his son to that for me, because that's how much he loved me. If you say you love God, but if you don't love your brothers and sisters, what does it talk about in James? You're a liar. He goes after them, calls us liars. Because there's no way that we can love a God that we can't see. But yet we have our brothers and we have family members or people that did us wrong in front of us. And we say, no. We got it mixed up, guys. If we really say that we love God, well then you know what? We're going to do anything we can. I'm not saying that you have to put yourself with a person that's always talking down to you. Who's always doing harm to you. <coughs> you don't got to go there. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is we, we truly have to forgive. Remember, God is going to judge the intention of the heart. He knows our hearts. We can go with a pretty smile, pretty face, looking good. Well, thank you. I love you, sister. But then when you walk away, you I can't even stand. <laughs> I can't even go around them. Look at the way they are. Is that really forgiveness? No. Imagine if God did that to us. <clears throat> Imagine now, when Jesus was going through all the affliction and all the hurting, when his, when his meat was being ripped out of him. If anybody would have turned upon and said, you know what, I don't want to do this with him, Lord. I have no reason to. He could have done that, guys, but he didn't. He didn't. Come on. But yet we want to hold something against somebody, or we want to point fingers. Or a lot of the times, we think we're better than others. I've been, I've met it too long. Oh, well, I can afford this, I can do this. Well, good for you. But what about those that are hurting and in need? Don't forget where we came from, guys. Where God pulled us out of. We can't forget that. Because like I said, we don't deserve. We don't deserve to be sitting here. None of us. We don't deserve it, guys. Even sometimes I would treat our wives. And I'm guilty of all that. It says train a child in the way that they should go. Parents, don't agitate, don't aggravate your children. But yet we don't want to show mercy to our children. Don't listen to that, Richie. <laughs> but it's true. We don't want to show mercy and grace to our children. And then when our children try to correct us and tell us, well, isn't that what you're doing? Oh, well, I'm the adult here. You don't tell me what I need to do. Oh, we don't want our kids smoking. We don't want our kids drinking. We don't want our kids doing any of that, but yet we're still doing it. So why are you going to get mad at your kid if he comes one day at the age of 11 and smoking a cigarette? Why should we get mad at them? Or drinking a beer? Or hitting their mom and dad in front of them and then they want to go beat other people. Yeah. That's what we show them. But and then when they do that, we're the mercy and the grace that we show our children. A lot of us don't. The Bible tells us everything how to do it. And yes, I do fall short every day, guys. Yes. But and then I try the next day, Lord, help me to do better. Help me to do better. Help me to do better. Amen. 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 Colossians chapter 4, verses 4 to 6. <laughs> that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walking in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. <clears throat> Let your speech always be with gracious, seasoned salt. That you may know how you ought to answer each other. It's like I said, how many of us want our families and our loved ones to be saved? We're always thinking we're good or putting them down. Because God has blessed us with a good job and we dress nice and we do this. And, and our job is we want our loved ones. We want everyone to be saved. But yes, if we're always going to be walking around as Christians, always, you know, just saying, doing things that we shouldn't. And then they do 
something to us and we don't want to show mercy or grace to them, how do we want them to be saved? How do we want people to be saved if we don't want to do the same? Do unto others as you want done to you, the Word of God says. Amen. Do unto others. It doesn't say do unto yourself. And a lot of us are still holding self here. <clears throat> we still make it about ourselves. You know that same God in, uh, in, in Isaiah 14, Satan got thrown from heaven because I will do this. I will reach to the heavens. I will become like the most high. I, 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 I. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? When we come to Christ, it's not about us anymore. The word of God said it's about esteeming others better than ourselves. And that's what it truly is about. I used to have a hard time with money, giving people money. I really did. I worked for my money. Why do I have to give them? They could go get a job. Half of those people standing at the light right there, then they can work. I don't see them being sick. If they can stand there for hours and ask for money, they can go get a job. Well, you know what? The Bible says judge nothing, nothing before it's time. <laughs> see, we don't know what God is doing in people's lives. Our job is to focus on God and do as God calls us to do. Our job is to be obedient to God. <clears throat> Our purpose that we were born was to worship, to honor, and to love God. That's our purpose. And when we love God, everything falls in place, guys. Literally, everything falls in place. When we say we love God, and we demonstrate, and our actions will show it. Faith without works is dead, right? Yeah. It says in James, show me your faith. Or show me your action, or show me your faith. It says, but when we don't do none of that, what is us? We, we don't even have faith and we also don't believe the word of God. Yeah. Because when we believe the word of God, we're going to do what the word tells us to do. And you know what's so awesome about God? Well, I'll read that more in scripture. Second Peter 3 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. As some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, and not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And what's the to me the major word there is long suffering. Father, you have me in a place, and, and I and I pray for you know for here I'm praying for that person at work. And I still have to endure my boss. My boss, when I worked at, at, at Los Alamos, he would mock God so much in front of me. He would literally talk down on God. And you know how hard it was for me to say something to him? So finally, I couldn't, I, I couldn't take it anymore. And I told him, you know what? Keep on mocking God, I says. God has me here for a reason, I says. But keep on mocking God. And God have mercy on me, I told him, because you're not going to get away with it. If you don't believe in God or whatever I told him, well, that's your, that's your, it's up to you. But that's my God, and please don't do that in front of me, I says. How would you like for me to disrespect your mom or your dad? Well, that won't be cool. Well, exactly. God is my father. So don't disrespect him in front of me. We had a couple of, you know, of going things. I could have said harsh words. I could have told him straight off, you know what? You're going to go to hell. You're going to go to hell straight up because of the way you live, by the way you want God. <clears throat> did things cross my mind? Of course they did. Of course they did. I could have told this man some stuff and put him straight. But you know what? If I would have done all that, guess what? The testimony of my Jesus Christ would have went out the door. Yeah. I told you, he professes to be a Christian. Amen. He professes to be this. <clears throat> At the end, because I would pray for him every day. I literally would pray for this man. All of a sudden, he started being nice to me. One day I walked in because I worked at the lab and well, they have big old big buildings, you know, and I was doing some, I was painting some metal buildings, some big old metal pieces that they use. 
And he comes in and he looks at my work and because I've always been, I'm a clean, I, I try to be a clean person, especially when even when I'm working, I like to put everything in order, you know. And he comes in and tells me, man, Luciano, he says, out of all these men that I work with, he goes, you keep your stuff in order. He goes, and I like that. And he's like, wow. <laughs> I could have said something negative, well, it's about time you notice, or you know, I could have did just something, but I didn't. Thank you, I told him. I appreciate it. And God bless you. I would tell him. But every time you tell him God bless you, you would see that little, like, like, you know, a little smirk. <laughs> but you know what? That's okay, though. That's okay. There's a purpose and a reason in our lives why we're there at the time when we're at. It doesn't matter where we're at, where we're working, we're at the store. Every day there's a purpose in our lives. And we have to use that purpose some way, somehow. Amen. Even if it's like a kind word opening the door to somebody. God bless you. Have a nice day. Can I help you with that basket? Can I do this? You know those little things could change somebody's life? And like I said, yes, that day that I took, yesterday that I took that day, that I put, oh, I'm not boasting what I've done. But just think, and I actually prayed with her too. So I, if I would have turned back and went and did what God told me to do, I would have lost the opportunity to pray for her. Because we prayed together and for her husband. And not only that, she, she probably already thought in her mind, they're not coming back. How many people tell somebody something and they don't go through with it? But, you know, we have to be men and women of integrity. Let your yes be yes, and let your no's be no. And if you can't do it, just say, I can't do it today, or I can't. Amen. A lot of us, we right away jump to conclusions. Oh, I'll be there. I can't do it. I'm going to show up. I'll... And then when you... Well, where are they at? Where are they at? No integrity. We want people to know God. We want people to be saved. That's what we're here for. When Jesus went and sent them two by two, there were 72 of them and he sent them two by two. He sent them to go. To go and tell them. The Great Commission, go and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He says, go. And that's what our job should be is go. Isaiah Send me, Lord. I'll go. How many of us have that attitude? Send me, God. I'll go. I'll do it. But a lot of the times we're too busy. We're too busy. You know that the enemy likes to bring a lot of, uh, a lot of, throw a lot of stuff to us? To get caught us up? To go do the things that God has called us to do? See, the Holy Spirit tells us and convicts us. Our conscience starts bothering us because we know we need to do something. Just imagine when God was on the cross and he would just be telling his dad, you know, making excuses. Just give me five more minutes, dad. Or just, just, just wait, just wait. That would have never got done. We procrastinate a lot. Here. But yeah, when we're ready to do something to go somewhere or do something, go camping, go on vacation, boy, are we ready to go, aren't we? Amen. We come to church. Sometimes we come late. Sometimes we don't come at all. <coughs> Imagine if God would tell us, you know what? Every time that you come late, I'm going to be late for you. I'm going to take time in answering your prayers. Or you know what? Why don't you just wait a minute? Because a lot of the times that's what we tell God, just wait a minute. Some of us spend more time in our, in our, in our phones than, on, than in the Word of God on Facebook. Guilty. We need to start reflecting. We need to start thinking. We need to, to, to start getting in the Word of God. The Bible says that we have the, we have the mind of Christ. How are we going to know what God wants us to do? If we're not going to be in His Word. And just come to church on, on, on Sundays and Wednesdays. And then the rest of the week, we're putting this behind. The Bible says that my sheep hear my voice. A lot of us, God, you know, brother, God, I can't hear God. He's, he's not talking to me. I'm praying and asking. I don't know what to do. 
Well, what do you mean you know what to do? He talks to you all the time. The answers are right here. I'm struggling in this area. I don't know what to do. But whatever the struggle is, it's right here. It says, first seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness. All things will be added unto you. When we put God first and we seek His kingdom, guess what? Everything else falls in place. Everything falls in place in our lives. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not in our own understanding, but acknowledge Him in all ways. And He shall be happy. So if you're looking for an answer, He will lead you and guide you and direct you where you need to be. Hosea 4, 6. And my people perish for that knowledge. Why are you perishing? Some of us are going to fall away from our faith because we're going to we're going to be deceived by lying evil spirits in the last days. That's why it's important to be the word. You know, that one person that God might bring into our lives, that one person, that day, and we could miss out on it. I can't wait to get into the prisons. Not as a prisoner, but <laughs> to go. Because those men hurt in there. Those men need to be shown mercy and grace in the woods prison as well, wow, guys. How many of us pray for them? I know that when I was I was a Christian, nothing like that crossed my mind. Nothing like that crossed my mind. And even sometimes I start getting slack. And I get to pray for those that are in prison. Jesus, Lord, when did we see you go hungry? Lord, when did we see you sick? Lord, when did we see you in prison? When you did to the least of my he says you did it unto me. He says. So we need to remember, brothers and sisters, any time that we do something for the glory of God is for him and not about us. It's not so that we can get the glory. It's not so that people could come and say, man, you're doing a good job. I see you doing this. I see you doing that. Don't tell your left or your right hand what you mean. Everything that we do, everything that we purpose to do in our lives now, because it's not our lives anymore. We need to do it unto Christ. Doing it as you're doing it unto Christ. When we're at work, when somebody does something to us, doing it as we're doing it unto Christ. The Bible is on top. It says, let no corrupt speech come out of your mouth. He teaches us. He teaches us just like me, our wife has had a little baby. As we bring them up, we want to teach them the right way, right? Don't say bad words, son. Don't be disrespectful to the elders. Don't be throwing rocks. Don't be doing this. We tell them for a good reason. Well, that's what God does to us, our Father. He left us that book to show us how to live, to how to conduct ourselves. He tells us, don't conform to the ways of the world. But be transformed by the renewing of the mind. Why does he tell us not to conform to the things of the world? Because when we once were in the world, all those things, all they did was hurt us. Amen. The alcohol, the drugs, the watching the porn, the secular music. All that hurts us. But again, we want to tell our children not to do it, but yet we're doing it. So what right do we have to correct our children and we're doing it? All even says they're wrong. You cheat, you steal, or you do this, but you're doing it yourself. And we want to correct people, we can't. Matthew <coughs> 18, 21 through 22. The parable of the unforgiving servant. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often my brother sin against me? And I forgive him up to seven times. And then Jesus still went further. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Meaning that we continually forgive somebody. No matter what, it's a continually thing. Because why? Because don't we mess up throughout the day? Even the bad thought. And what does God say? 1 John 1, 9 says that if you confess your sins to me, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. 
It is the love of God that leads people to repentance. So when we're showing that love and that forgiveness, guess what? Eventually they're going to come, guys. Eventually they're going to come because they're going to say, you know what? I know this person for years. I know that this person, they have done him so wrong. They've done so much to me, but yet he or she is walking in love. I see how they how they how, how they forgive people. You know what? How many people, and I'm gonna be honest, in, in the years of your guys walk, and, 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 and only you guys know this. How many people have said, you know what, brother, you have something, or sister, I want I want you to have. How many of us have said that somebody has literally told them I want to have? See, that's what we need to do. That's what we need to be. Christ-like. For somebody to tell you, I want what you have. And then that opens up an opportunity to tell them, I got Jesus. He's the one that changed and transformed my life. He is the one that has me here today. Because he has. Because he has. Ephesians 2, 4, and 5. But God so rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. By grace we have been saved. 